All right, it's Thursday night, time for Real Monsters. I'm your host, S.K. Barrett, coming to you live from the great wet Northwest. And joining me is Wes Hobrick, as always. Hello, hello, All right. hello. And I it's think Thursday I night, time for Real there. Monsters. I'm your host, on, S.K. On Barrett, is coming that to better? you live from the great wet Northwest. And... And also me joining me, Wes Hobrick, as always, is uh, hello, hello, all right. hello. And I it's think Thursday I need night. Time out for real there. monsters. I get my I'm your host, on, S.K. On Barrett. Is that better? <laughs> Am I supposed to say Northwest? my name? Hey, Kelly. Sorry, I've been. And I, I got lost in me, some Hobrick, audio feedback. Is, <laughs> hello, hello. Right. myself. Hey. Say hi, Kelly. How you doing? I'm your host, S.K. Barrett. Is that better? Am I supposed to say my name? Hey, Kelly, sorry, I've been... I'm not taking this at all, sir. Oh, man, I'm just getting <laughs> so much. I just produced myself. Hey. Say hi, Kelly. I can't... I've, I'm hearing so many versions of the stream in my headphones right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, hey, Kelly, sorry, listening to myself. Oh, man, I'm Audio just getting so... Are you muted on YouTube? I am muted on YouTube, and I also so turned the speaker of off on my phone, head, so it was right a little now. loud, but <laughs> it's like, it shouldn't know, be as bad now. Is that yeah. stay the same? That's the problem I had last time. I wasn't muted on uh, Are you muted YouTube, on YouTube, and it was, it was causing all kinds of stuff. I am muted on... I even muted my computer speakers as well. Oh, I know what it is. Like, I'm hearing bandwidth. you. Oh, no, it was me. I was... Uh, I had the... Uh, yeah, it's my fault. It's my <laughs> fault. Surprise. I was doing it to myself. <laughs> hey, let's talk Nazis. <laughs> but first... But first, before we get into the really awful shit that the Nazis did. And I know that's not narrowing it down, <laughs> but we will for the show. Let's let's have our pre-show palate cleanser, M of the week, uh, doing what she loves to do. One of the things she loves to do is ride in the car. Oh. I am. She is a good Aww. traveler. She, she loves to ride in the car. And she, like a two-year-old, you know dogs are an awful lot like two-year-olds. Um, <laughs> in a lot of ways. And one of the ways that she's like a two-year-old is if she gets restless at night, i got to take her for a ride in the car <laughs> to calm her down so she'll settle down for the <laughs> night. Hmm. <laughs> Okay, on to business. We are going to be talking about... So we've been talking art crimes for the last uh, two weeks, and now we're going to get into the, a level of art crime that is beyond comprehension almost. Yeah. yeah. So take it away, Kelly. Kelly. Well, just that beyond comprehension, just to put an actual number on it, because, you know, I used to be in data analysis. They reckon that 20% of European um, um, culture 
art, history, everything was destroyed um, because the Nazis stole so much and destroyed so much. So it wasn't just the stealing. They actually destroyed um, a lot of stuff, like entire cultures, buildings and churches and, you know, castles and things like that. Um, and uh, does that include uh, art and culture that was destroyed as a side effect of the war? That, um, or was mean, it like bombing, you know, being, you know, cities like being Harvard bombed effects. and stuff like that? Um, no, I think that just, it doesn't include like allied bombings or anything like that. It's okay. just stuff that Hitler and his, and his mates did. So, wow. Uh, so what I thought I would do, that was just to, because we were talking about the largest, it, it is the largest art crime basically in human history. Um, so what I want to go through is maybe divide, put, put it into two parts tonight, like go through what was stolen and how they did it. Um, Sounds good. And then mm -hmm. the second part would be um, sort of like the repatriation, the restitution, what's going on with that today. And um, it'll get interesting because there was a very, very large cache of artwork found in 2012. Um, so we'll talk about that a bit later. But, um, but yeah, basically, I mean, everybody, I think, I don't think we need to know um, the history lesson on Hitler. He was an artist in his own right. He was self-taught. Um, he thought he was very, very talented, and he applied to the um, um, art school in Vienna and or in Austria, Austria, and he got turned down twice. Um, now, I know we were talking about this before, and we were talking about what his beliefs were prior to that happening and what kind of inciting incident that might have been. Um, but he actually kind of blamed the panel for turning him down because there were quite a few um, Jewish people on the panel. And here, um, here's an example of Hitler's work. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's just a basic painting. Um, yep. But the problem was the problem was with the art um, school is that avant-garde was really coming into force and the modern art um, and like Picasso and um, Paul Klee and, you know, things like that, you know, the surrealist movement, the cubist movement. And this, that one doesn't show a lot of imagination. You know, no, that's exactly all. my reaction to it. It's like, yeah. it's it's not terrible, but it's like, nah. Yeah, it's like, nah, I'm not going to go out of my way to look at that. No, but... and, it's, and it's just not what they were looking for at the school, so they turned him down. They thought his art was, yeah, very unimagin unimaginative, and they were looking for um, the more avant-garde modern stuff that he actually grew to hate. So, oh, and guess he, what? He was a very yeah. unimaginative uh, military leader, too. <laughs> he really was. I can... Now, um, Kelly, stop me if we're getting ahead here, but when people hear the term degenerate art, as yeah. used by, say, uh, Joseph Goebbels or Hitler himself, mm -hmm. what did that actually mean? He divided art into two different categories. So the degenerate art, and we'll get into this because he held a, an art an art show um, called the the degenerative art ugh, degenerative art show, um, and basically anything up to early 1900 was all considered very classical, very ordered. Um, you can see by his painting, you know, the, there's the columns. Everything's very ordered. Everything's very, you know, peaceful and um, very Greek Romanish sort of thing. Whereas anything, um, the, the, the degenerative stuff was um, the new, the Bolshevik art, the Cubism, um, things that German did, expressionism, German expressionism, things that didn't have um, any classical lines to them, things that um, criticize society. Um, in ways that hadn't been seen before, just through the actual art forms. And he did not like that. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of what I was after, because it, some people, I think, might mean, oh, he's just saying Jewish art no, no, when there, they say that. But no, okay. No, it wasn't just Jewish people. It was the art. I mean, okay, the Jewish part does come into it in a massive way. Like, don't, I'm not discounting that. But in, in terms of the actual yeah. It wasn't just Jewish people. Um, in fact, it wasn't exclusive. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was asking. There, there were um, Jewish artists included in the degenerate art um, uh, show that he put on, but a majority of them actually weren't Jewish. They were just what he referred to as degenerative. Like I said, ultra modern. Um, he particularly didn't like the ones that criticized anything that the German people had done. Um, so there were some modern artists who were starting to paint pictures of like, um, um, like from World War One and from um, 
the pictures of the soldiers not quite being proper mm -hmm. soldiers. They might have been, you know. Um, so he didn't like anything like that. So anything that showed any disrespect to the German people was automatically labeled degenerative. Um, anything that was just um, chaotic, basically, anything that didn't follow the classical Greek and Roman um, lines and the instruction for art, he, he claimed was degenerate. Now having, now, having said that, that doesn't mean that some of his colleagues didn't collect it in their spare time. <laughs> <laughs> but we will, yeah. We'll get to of course. Uh, yeah, I didn't want to jump ahead of you there or anything. Yeah. But... No, I mean, uh, if you if you if you want to if you ask if you have a question or want to say something, jump in, and then if I'm going to cover it later, I'll just say you know yeah we're we've got that covered for later. Okay. Uh, okay. But yeah, so basically he. <laughs> He saw literally hundreds of thousands of pieces of art. Um, they estimate that um, 15 to 20 billion pounds of art, so that's uh, 20, that's 21 million to 28 million U.S. dollars worth of looted art is still out there waiting to be claimed. Wow. There were 2,000 pieces looted from France um, that they know are in France right now. Um, How, the theft, wait, sorry, they, the theft, they know they're in France? Yeah. We'll get, yeah, we'll okay. get to that. comes to the museums and, and stuff oh, like that. Oh, yeah. okay. So basically he, once he was made chancellor in, I think it was 1933, that's when he really started becoming kind of like the, um, the head of German art. Like he was the head of German culture, what he said goes. And if, if he didn't agree with it, it wasn't considered German art and culture. And then he very systematically started going after country by country. So he started with Austria and then, cause Austria was annexed first. I think. The Anschluss. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the theft in Poland was 43% of the Polish cultural heritage was destroyed or stolen. That's $20 billion USD that they, that he and his, and and the other Nazis took from Poland alone. Wow. Yeah, a um, hundred thousand pieces um, from France alone, because um, he really, really him and his him and his colleagues hit up France an awful lot. Yeah. Um, so that just gives you an idea of the scale of you know sort of what they took, um, how much they took. Well, <clears throat> didn't do it alone, obviously. Um, there was an organization, and I'm just trying to. It's called the ERR, and basically in German, it just basically means like the the art cleanup crew. Um, and there are a lot of people assigned to the ERR, and basically its job was to go and to clean out all of the art. So whether it was getting rid of the modern stuff and collecting the good stuff for Hitler, or getting rid of the modern stuff um, and giving the modern stuff to some of Hitler's friends. Um, huh. But there, but there was this group, actual like a dedicated group for going and just taking all of this stuff. Um, I don't know if people realize, but Hitler wanted to put up something um, called the Führer Museum in his hometown in Austria, and it was supposed to be one of the largest art gal, well, the largest art gallery in the world, and it was supposed to have everything from prehistory right up until the early 1900s. So the modern stuff, no, not even getting a look in in this place. It, ha it was supposed to have an opera, um, an opera house, shops, theaters, and Hitler's tomb was supposed to be in the very center of it. And it never got built. Um, mm -hmm. They do they do have some sort of architectural drawings. So I don't know if anybody's seen the movie um, Museum Men. Monuments Men. Monuments Men. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, yeah, I just rewatched that. There's a scene in there where they're looking at like a, a model, a mock-up of what this thing is supposed to look at. And it, it's it's enormous. It takes up like an entire city. Yeah. Um, and this is where he was going to store all of his art. So the ERR, part, part of their responsibility was to actually find art for the Fuhrer Museum. This was his big thing. Um, so Hitler's was, architect was an interesting fellow in yeah. himself, too. Yeah. I, I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but yeah. Um, I know his name. I know his name. Darn it. Now you've got me now. It's I... bugging me, too. I'll look. Well, Megalomaniacs don't, don't do small projects. It's something Spear, S-P-E-E-R. I don't remember the Albert first. Spear. Albert Spear. That's That's him. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm not yeah. actually talking him. So if you want to if you want to say something about him, because I'm going to what I'm going to do is talk about the three main people that helped him do all of this. And I'm not talking okay. about 
or Goebbels. I'm talking about art dealers that actually help uh, him do this. So did you want to talk about Spear a little bit? Oh, um, no, that's okay. I just, <laughs> that was a tangent there when you said about building this um, basically a monument to Nazi culture or a yeah. necropolis to the Third Reich after they lose the war. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, no, we can go on and go with the other stuff there. Maybe do okay. Spear on a different show, though. Remember at the time, it wasn't we're going to lose. It was Deutschland uber alles. So, you know. Right. Mm. <laughs> um, okay, so basically he, he had these organizations set up. So the ERR was the most famous one. And then he had people working with him um, to actually go and get these pieces and assess them. So he tended to, and it's the really weird thing about these, these I'm going to talk about three men. Um, the really weird thing about them is they all have similar backgrounds. Um, two of them grew up in, in Dresden. Um, they actually were art historians in their own right. Um, uh, one was called Hans Poss and the other was called Bruno Luce. And, um, Poss was, um, he studied art history, archeology, span um, and history in Vienna. He got a doctorate. Um, he was by all accounts, a very intelligent, um, person, but he was, um, he became the special representative of Hitler um, to expand the objects for the Führer Museum. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. So basically, um, he volunteered in a couple of museums. He grew up in the museum world. Um, he, he became um, one of the main curators at the Dresden Gallery. And he actually, he liked the avant-garde stuff. He actually pushed to, to hang it up. He actually was a fan of the avant-garde and the, the, st the degenerate stuff that Hitler would refer to. So mm -hmm. when the Nazis decided they were going to start taking art, because they not only took art from other um, other countries, they actually did it from their own museums. So Hitler, you know, went around to all the German museums as well and took what he wants and destroyed some of the other stuff. So when they saw the stuff in the Dresden Gallery, this guy um, was in huge trouble. He he actually got fired for because he had <laughs> because he had this art and everybody knew <laughs> he doesn't like this art. Um, Hitler actually found out about it. And wow. yeah, it actually stepped in. He visited Dresden. Um, he questioned Poss about his dismissal. He asked for all the documents associated with it. And he actually made the decision that he should get his job back. Um, <laughs> Poss, was, Poss kind of stood up a little bit and said, oh, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. I had to hang it up and other people wanted me to. And he must have presented an, an, a decent case because Hitler basically he got his job back. Um, and then a year later, they must have been talking. I, I can't find much information about what happened in that year. But Hitler invited him to a summer house. So they must have been quite chummy. Oh, wow. Um, and told him that he wanted to be, uh, wanted him to be um, the head of the project that would be gathering paintings for um, the Führer Museum. So this guy went, launched him, you know, he's from being fired in a Dresden museum. So now he's, he's actually in charge. Hmm. Yeah. Has the fears here on that? So interesting. So how do, how do the 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 Italians now? So Mussolini couldn't have been uh, a willing participant in the looting of his own country. How did um, that did or did they did they take much Italian stuff or did they kind of leave it alone because of Mussolini and the uh, alliance? Yeah, they kind of left them alone. I I couldn't find a lot. Like I started doing investigation about some of the countries I wasn't I wasn't as familiar with. Like like anybody that knows anything about this sort of the period in art and the looting that went on knows Poland, France, um, the sort of Germany, the sort of the three main ones, mm -hmm. um, Austria. Sorry. But Italy was, yeah, he kind of left them alone. It was it was very weird. <laughs> well, or maybe not. He did It sort of had that weird agreement, didn't they? Right. That's Until they didn't. <laughs> you guys can fill me in on that because that's I'm, I know the art stuff. I don't I don't really know much about the military agreements and stuff like that. But um, so, yeah, basically back to um, back to pass. He, he continued working, uh, working for them. Um, he got a lot of the artworks from um, um, Jewish people who were forced to, they were they were being forced out of the country. They saw what was coming, so before the concentration camps, but they were being forced out of the country, and they had mm -hmm. to sell their artwork to pay for it. 
and because they were Jewish and because a lot of it was modern art, they got lower prices um, for it. So these art historians not only looted the museums, they also took huge advantage of Jewish families that were fleeing at the time. So basically, yeah, if you had some artwork and you were Jewish, they take it, but you'd get maybe a quarter of the price if that. It was it was quite bad. Um, wow. No, quite bad. Is, it sounds trite, and I it, but I, I I mean it seriously. It was like these people were really <laughs> just taken advantage of left, right, and center. Um, so yeah, basically, he just um, he was using the uh, he was part of the ERR. Um, so basically, what happened is then they started. Um, so he went. So he was in France, and he was getting art from um, from the French museums, and they had quite a few of the modern bits as well. And instead of actually sort of filtering out the modern bits, um, he sort of gave them to some of the names that you probably will be familiar with. So, for example, um, Hermann Goering. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So he eventually um, sort of met up with Hermann Goering, and they, I guess they sort of got friendly if that's the right word for it <laughs> and um so a lot of the modern stuff actually or a lot of the modern stuff and a lot of the stuff that maybe um Post didn't think hitler would be interested in goering stepped in and went oh you know what that would look nice in my chalet so goering started taking away huge bits of art as well so he started sort of using the err to confiscate art for his own personal use so that was sort of that going on with all the high level nazis as well um, so basically yeah, he just, um, he, he just kept working. He was never caught. Um, the, Hitler referred to him as the professor. He was sort of given an honorific cause he was such, so good at his job. Um, and he never, he never got punished for it. He died of, um, of cancer in 1942. Mm -hmm. So before the war was even over, um, so it it was kind of a yeah um so at his funeral all of the senior art directors of all of the museums were invited goebbels was um the one that delivered the eulogy and it they reckon that he stole about 2500 artworks just for the Linz museum in the three years that he was head of the wow. er and that doesn't 2500 that doesn't count the stuff he gave to goering or goebbels or <laughs> or any of the other high ranking people or the stuff that was destroyed. This is just specific works that went to the, um, the Linz museum, the, the, um, Führer museum. So that's just one guy. Um, and that's just, yeah. over, just over three years. So you can imagine he had quite a few, he had at least half a dozen really close people. Um, um, so Pardon me, there's some a flight of geese going over. <laughs> you may have heard some honking in the background. <laughs> I was going to say the centralization of everything that the Nazis did. There's got to be, you know, 10 to everyone who's doing it, 10 who haven't been caught or even looked at. Yeah. yeah. Doing some sort of graft related to it. Well, the, um, the really sick thing is that a lot of these people didn't get caught. So the same people that were actually yeah. helping Nazis get the art actually after the war became the ones that were responsible for returning it to the owners. Wow. It's just, oh, it's this. Seriously, guys. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I so, mean, and how are they not caught? If the Germans are known for anything, it's for record keeping. Oh, yeah. I and I was going to say the records they kept actually were very helpful in actually getting the art back to their owners. Um, but there was one guy, uh, this guy called um, Bruno Luce, who I mentioned before. He was, again, another Führer Museum guy. Um, he actually did make it to the end of the war. And when they were, yeah, but what he did is he, um, he testified at Nuremberg. Oh, wow. And he gave them all kinds of um, information. Um, so he was at the Nuremberg trials. He provided evidence against like everybody. He basically told everything, everything. And he said that he actually had a personal distaste for the ERR. He didn't really want to do it. Um, he was kind of described as sort of known to lie, but still he helped them out. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, still, that was making me think of it when you were talking about the people, um, the Nazis handing their paintings back to who they stole them from. Yeah. You know, I could just picture that, them handing it and saying, 
Oh, just following orders and shrugging their shoulders. That happened a lot, yeah. I think not just with the art. I mean, the oh, whole. Oh, that was a common de uh, defense. But, oh, yeah. But also, but also, you know, if you're the one that took it, how hard are you going to look for the rightful owners? I know. Seriously. Oh, yeah. well, there's a, I'm, I'm actually going to get into a little bit about what museums are doing and how they how they're trying to get artwork back and what the, what the world is like, because it's it's progressed quite a lot, actually. Um, but this uh, um, this low guy. So he he actually was acquitted in 1950. Um, he was told that he wasn't supposed to be an art dealer anymore, but the German authorities kind of said, yeah, go on, we'll just turn a blind eye. Um, and he was actually he was actually one of a lot of Nazi art dealers who actually had their own restitution claims because they claimed after they were arrested, they lost all their art. So oh. they wanted it back. Like, it's crazy. Huh. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Give me my stolen shit back. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> No, I um, bought that oh fair and square for a quarter of a penny on the dollar. <laughs> I know. And this Losis guy, um, his collection was supposed to, it was um, mostly Dutch old masters because they did have specialties. So, like, he did Dutch old masters, expressionist paintings, and it was supposed to be in, like, millions of dollars worth of art that he said he should have back. Wow. wow. So yeah, you it's... said that was about $22 million in today's dollars? what stuff waiting to be sort of rescued um the figure you said at the beginning 20 okay so 20 21 to 28 billion us oh dollars. billion yeah okay i misheard my apologies yeah no that, we're we're talking huge numbers here yeah today's dollars for that okay yeah. I had to, and I also um all the like the articles and some of the stuff a lot of the art museums i follow are british so i had to do the like translate the British ah. history and, and, and a lot of the time when you're talking about like Austria, they'll talk about Austrian, you know, anyway. Um, so, yeah. So basically there's not a heck of a lot that the museums could do to prepare for what they knew was coming, but just the picture that you've got on the screen now is, is one of the interesting examples. So, and there was another picture of it as well. that showed a giant empty gallery. So basically the Louvre, um, they were, they were dead smart. So they were more worried about being bombed. Um, they hadn't been looted, but the bombings had started, um, like the, the Germans had started bombing. So one handy dandy man there, um, got together with a bunch of his other curators and he said, you know what? Um, I think it was the director of the museum. He said, you know what? We're going to have practice evacuation drills. So they did that for a little while. And then when the bombing got closer one day, they said, right, this is it. It's go time. So they closed the museum down supposedly for repairs. They emptied the entire museum in three days. Holy cow. That's, yeah. that's wow. a substantial logistical uh, undertaking. Yeah. So the picture you're seeing now is, um, I think it's it's called Winged Victory. It's one of the statues that's actually in the Louvre. And I think it's about eight tons. And so what they had to do was build this ramp, because it's at the top of a bunch of stairs, as you can see. Mm -hmm. um, they had to build um, this ramp thing and just inch her down just so slowly. You can kind of see the wings off there. You can kind of see, like, she's in a crate kind of thing with her upper body sticking out. Um, but they had to be just incredibly careful. Um, the Mona Lisa, obviously, we keep talking about. This is the third time we can mention the Mona Lisa. <laughs> um, she hmm. On crate, she was carefully wrapped. Um, she was put onto a truck that was painted to look like an ambulance. And during the few years after this... Um, after the Louvre um, thing, she was um, moved around quite a lot so that they could always keep ahead of uh, um, ahead of the Nazis. So basically, four hundred thousand pieces were moved out of the museum to protect them from the Nazis. Holy cow! Well, like, anybody want to guess what that uh, rate, what that money would be back then? I did a reverse inflation calculator with oh, it. That's not that's modern. Oh, okay. Sorry, that's I misunderstood. Yeah. Sorry, that that is um, a Smithsonian article from about uh, maybe 2013, 2014. Ah. So it's it's modernish. Yeah. Sorry, I should I should quote my sources. No, that's all right. You um, run it. That's so, a different number. So the the Louvre thing just is an, another astonishing fact for you. Thirty seven convoys of eight trucks each departed from the Louvre, filled with art. Wow. Where did they go? Like south or 
everywhere. It, all, they, di- it, all directions? They didn't, all direct- they didn't bunch it all up together? Um, they took it, they took it to, oh, now you got me. Um, I don't remember the name of it. There's a, like a castle sort of thing. They took it all there and they kind of met there and then they decided where it was going to go from there. But yeah, basically it just went all over France um, to be hidden. This was in 1940, so it was still fairly early on. Hmm. Just looking through my note and I've just got Spear Architect sitting here with no, no note or anything next to it. <laughs> It's too bad the uh, Louvre uh, people running the Louvre had, weren't in charge of the French defenses. <laughs> it, yeah. might, it might have slowed them down a little bit. <laughs> Unfortunately, even with all that work, um, the paintings were all, everything was found. The Nazis just found everything. Oh, man. So, yeah. I mean, they, they even did get a hold of the Mona Lisa. She was one of the ones that was um, stored in the salt mine. So, oh, really? so, just, so they got her back, but yeah, um, she was, so basically that's, yeah. So the Nazis are doing this systematically going and, um, just raiding everything. Um, they, they destroyed quite a lot, um, the degenerate art. So yeah, oh yeah, we should probably talk a little bit more about the degenerate art, shouldn't we? Yeah, sure. Okay. So basically what Hitler did was he actually set up, um, two different, I'm just trying to think, I'm trying to get the German name for the degenerate art. I've got it written here someplace. Um, so basically, they set up two different art shows. One was for the degenerate art, and oh, here it is, Entartet Kunst, and it was 1937 in Munich. So they basically set it up, and they set it up so that it was like things weren't hung properly. Oh, that picture you got up there is the Louvre after they evacuated it. So that's what the main ga- the main gallery looked like. I got that Kunst poster coming right up. Okay. Oh, yeah. The, even the Kunst poster is interesting in its own right because the, the writing on it is terrifying. It's red and it's scratchy and it's meant to instill fear. And the, the, the actual Kunst is, you know, the writing and everything. Um, and what they did was they, um, they hung up all the paintings. Some of them weren't even hung up. Some of them were just laying on the floor. Some of them were hung sideways. Um, it was not a curated show. It was meant to show the art in the worst possible light. So that Exaggerated when people, features. It, when people walk, the, it was like, look at all this degenerate art, look at how horrible it is. Whereas mm-hmm. if you went to the other, um, the show that he put on, the classical show, it was all beautifully curated. It was, you know, spaced out. There was lots of white space. You could get a good look at all the paintings. Everything was classical, so it was pre-1900. Um, there were lots of Roman and um, and Greek sculptures in there. Everything that Hitler loved. Um, the thing is, though, <clears throat> hardly anybody visited the classical one. And <laughs> yeah, I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's fabulous. Wait, it gets, it gets better. Over two million people went to the other the the, the um, Antarcticans. <laughs> wow, that's and, awesome. Yeah, more. So it just shows that you tell someone they can't do something, then they're, they're going to want to do it even more. It's just, um, yep. but yeah, he did. I think he did more for modern art than a lot of people did without even meaning to, just by doing, you know, the um, the Antarctic goods. So it's yeah, it was supposed to be all the despised art. It actually did a tour. Um, it toured Germany <clears throat> so that he could scare everybody into believing that it was just the wrong type of art for the German people. And oh, it's terrible. It's, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, more people went to that than any of the other stuff that he put on, which I thought was... Well, it's pretty interesting how uh, the after effects of that were... Um, he did a large part for launching New York as the new center of the art world with the war and then what with what he was doing with the well, degenerate art. A lot of the... Um, a lot of the... It's funny you mentioned that the, a lot of the Jewish families in... Uh, and Germany and France and, and Poland and, and the areas saw what was coming. So they started mm-hmm. their art out, um, you know, as quickly as they possibly could. Mm-hmm. And most of it went to either family that they already had in New York or storage in New York or to art dealers in New York if they, you know. So, yeah, and it was a lot of modern stuff. So it definitely did sort of kick off the modern art movement over in, in uh in the u.s or at least it it contributed to it oh yeah in new york and actually in l.a too you had quite a few directors who fleed um what was going on in germany and the surrounding 
countries like uh, Fritz Lang or uh, Billy Wilder was yeah. another one. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Some like it hot for people who don't know his name. Yeah. If you ever get a chance, um, oh, not my brain's going to fail me. In New York, there's uh, there's an art gallery in New York that used to be someone's home, the Frick. Um, if you ever get a chance, go to the Frick. It's 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 a small museum, but it's got a lot of modern art. And I've not looked up the history of it, but I, I suspect that it might have been um, like previously owned by Jewish families, and um, part of it was shipped over um, so that it couldn't be taken by the Nazis. But it's a wonderful place. It's like walking through someone's living room and seeing art. <laughs> mm-hmm. Cool. Uh, okay, so I know we're going to get on to um, how is this stuff being returned, and to do that, I want to talk about one last. Um, uh, helper of the Nazi. So his name is Hildebrandt Gerlitt, and he was an art historian. Again, art historian, dealer, they all have the same sort of background. Um, he, Hildebrandt lost his job um, fairly on in, in sort of the war because people just weren't, he was a, an art dealer, people just weren't buying the modern art, and he really liked the modern art. Um, but he went on to... Um, work with Hitler, who, again, same sort of thing, started um, stealing all the art, um, put together personal journals for Hitler so that, you know, he knew what um, was coming and what was suggested for his museum. Um, he got in really, really well with Goebbels. Um, he basically collected art for Goebbels. They were good friends. And afterwards, um, oh, and he was actually a quarter Jewish. Just, I think it's significant to mention that because he did, he, he, didn't mind working for um, working for the Germans. So he was hired by the Nazis to work as a dealer for the state. Um, he was one of four dealers charged with making money from degenerate art. So he had the modern art and he was selling that. Um, he tended to buy art from people. Remember I mentioned people who were perse- persecuted and they were fleeing the country and they had right. to sell their art for money. He was one of the people that mm-hmm. re- relied heavily um, on these families. And he actually claimed that he had he was saving the art. Um, uh, by, sure. But yeah, because otherwise, you know, if he didn't buy it off of them at ridiculous prices, low prices, then the Nazis would get it. So he actually considered himself a bit of a hero. Um, he also he went to hmm. Paris for art for the um, for the Nazis. He was well. Personal- hold on, I have yeah. a I have a question about that um, d- defense. Mm-hmm. Once he bought it, what happened to it? Didn't it go to the Nazis anyway? Some of it did, yeah. But we'll so, get to how was that saving it? Well, I think I don't know. <laughs> what was thing in his head, I don't know. Right. Um, not all of it. Unless went. he's hiding it. Well, uh, well, just let me just. Okay. Yeah. Okay. This is an interesting little twist to this story. So, um, so yeah, he actually. Goebbels was it was interested in some of the modern art, so he actually gave some of it to Goebbels. He gave some of it to Goering. He gave some of it to himself, so he started hoarding it. So you're right; he started collecting all the modern art as well. Um, basically, after he died, um, he was never found. He was never found guilty. Um, he had all this art, and at the end of the war, he needed a way to keep it safe for himself. So what he did was he actually moved it from his home. Um, to a farmhouse in Dresden, and Dresden was bombed horribly. Like there was yeah. a night when it was everything was the, the, the city was leveled pretty much. So when they tried to you know pin the crime on him, he said, "Oh, all the art was destroyed in the Dresden bombing. Sorry, I don't have any of it anymore." And since he didn't have any of it and he couldn't prove anything, he was let go. Um, but he also lied, which is such a strange thing for a Nazi. Um, <laughs> He had actually moved the art out of Dresden without anybody knowing. And then after he died, um, his son inherited it. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. Because his son, his name was Cornelius Gerlitt, Gerlitt um, lived in Munich. And he was a recluse. He, this is the picture of him that you're seeing on the, um, on the screen right now. And he was a recluse. He basically hadn't watched TV since like the 60s. He had no health insurance. He hadn't paid any tax. Um, he had a bit of money from his um, from his father, and he had been sort of like selling a few minor pieces 
Um, but what happened in 2012, I think it happened in 2011, actually, is his father's name was on, there's a, there's a list of kind of like red flag names. And his father was one of those red flag names. And these lists mm. exist in, like in every country. Every country has access to them. There's databases that have them. There are numerous databases that um, have names and art and all kinds of flagging. So basically, um, in, I think it was 20, when did he go to Switzerland? So basically, he um, tried to go to Switzerland in, uh, I think it was 2011. I guess he was actually getting old and he needed some care. Um, and he took 9,000 euros with him. Now, that's the absolute most that you can take from one country to another um, in Europe. So it raised a couple of eyebrows. Um, and that, and he went to the bank and he wanted to deposit some of it in the bank. And because he had so much money on him, that raised eyebrows as well. And then when they looked up, the first woman at the bank figured out, oh, this guy's a girlit. Let's go look in the database. Sure enough, with the money and the weird trip to Switzerland um, and the fact that he was depositing it and the fact that his name was Gurlitt, someone finally figured out, okay, maybe we should look into this guy. So in 2012, mm -hmm. they raided his house. They found 1,400 pieces of art. Wow. Wow were all pretty much modern art. Now, because the guy was a recluse, he was a bit of a, I don't know, he was a bit of an odd one. He didn't really talk. Um, he basically would pass notes to people if they came to his door. Um, he considered the artworks his friends. He didn't. He wasn't aware of how much they were worth. He knew they were stolen. He knew they came from his dad. He knew the history of them, but he considered them his friends, like literally his friends. He would sit and talk to them. Oh, my word. Yeah. Yeah. That's what solitary confinement will do to you, whether it's self-imposed or otherwise. Yeah. And because he hadn't paid any tax, he had no insurance, um, he was completely off the radar for all these years. But they figured out that the collection of 1,400 artworks was worth $1.2 billion U.S. <gasps> wow. Yeah. And this was in 2020. Yeah, there's all kinds of documentaries on this guy. It's awesome. You should go look at it because he actually wanted most of it back. He told the authorities he wasn't giving it up because, again, the whole it's mine, I'm saving it, or I don't know, is just weird. Um, so they, they're they investigating, and they're still trying to sort out, like, because there's all this art and who it goes to, and and six months is not really a lot in, like, when a criminal investigation. Right. So six months yeah. later, he actually died six months later. Oh. Um, and after he mm -hmm. died even more art and some of the other properties that he had so at, at, as of right now the restitution process is ongoing they still have not figured out who all of this art belongs to now they <laughs> they found a few pieces um but in the meantime they like they found as many as they possibly could and then what happened was um according to his will it was going to the burn museum in switzerland now they are 100 percent positive a third of the collection it's not Nazi looted, so it's out on display, guilt free. Okay. I I take that with a grain of salt. Um, yeah, it gets me how some of these people seem to think that maritime law applies to these pieces of art. Yeah. It's like, it's, well, like you know, salvage rights. One, it's not yours. Yeah, but two thirds of the collection is still um, the investigation is still ongoing to to find out who the art belongs to. And the museum at least doesn't feel like they can display it while there's still questions about the art. Um, so can that you have a link we could share about that. Oh. Maybe the museum has a place people can go to learn more. Um, the Burn Museum. Uh, I don't have a link so actually. Is... I can look later and put it on our page if too. You do, if you do Cornelius Gurlitt, G U R, uh, is there two R's or one? G U R L I T T. Um, there's, okay. there's just tons of stuff on it because it's so recent and it just goes to show that there is art out there like it is still out there um, and it comes from some of the strangest places do you um, think this museum is making a good faith effort uh, I've learned a lot about Switzerland that <laughs> I didn't really want I was really surprised by just digging around for tonight. Um, I was aware of like like Hitler's art man and all this kind of stuff. Um, and I was aware of the extent of the art thefts and that kind of stuff and how it was being repatriated. But what I wasn't aware of was how different each country was 
um, and depending on what the current political situation was, how bad they are at getting art back. And unfortunately, Switzerland's one of the not such nice guys. <laughs> um, no. I mean, I don't want to slag off any country, but really, um, just to give you an example, a lot of the art made its way to Switzerland and into private vaults. And there was something um, in 1996 called the Bergier Commission, which basically um, was a bunch of countries signed up to it. And it was supposed to be investigate Switzerland, <laughs> basically find out how much went mm. into the banks. Um, and there's an example of, okay, so one bank was going to be investigated. They knew the investigators were coming, so they kind of went as a good faith sort of thing. They went, oh, here's some art we found. Go ahead and take it. We didn't know it was down there. Oh, yeah. God. But the commission came in. And, oh, it's like they, they must have thought, okay, we're going to be fine now. But the commission came in anyway and found a whole bunch of other stuff in the basement. What? I didn't know that was it. That wasn't mine. That belongs to my roommate. <laughs> you know, I don't know how that got there. You know, it's... <laughs> And elf left it there. It's just crazy. Um, having said that, most museums... So up until recently, this really wasn't taken that seriously. Um, museums and countries drag their feet about um, getting artwork back to well, who it should belong to. Um, but lately, and a lot of the, a lot of the problem um, up until recently was there was just no money um, being put into it they just they didn't have the money to investigate and they didn't have the experience there was no one experienced enough to go oh i recognize that that's a rembrandt it looks like it belongs in the rothschild collection like the guy did in monuments men um so and i wish i'd bring up monuments men actually because it's not just a movie it's actually a real story um yeah. but anyway yeah um so I, there have been a various commissions set up like i said the the Berger commission which is actually finished now it was supposed to be specifically to investigate switzerland um there are all kinds like museums actually have um heads of repatriation so they're very careful about you know all of this stuff um they also have um sotheby's for example so sotheby's has a global head of restitution um, so when art, because um, auction houses, massive, massive issue for auction houses. Um, I think we talked about when art theft um, happens, you have to have um, you have to have a complete history of who owns right. the painting. And if you've got any sort of gap at all, most art houses or most auction houses won't even touch you. Um, mm -hmm. The Nazi art comes in, and it's like, oh, there's a fuzzy couple of years in there. Um, so some auction houses will deal with Nazi art or, or art that was art that was moved during the Nazi period. Not necessarily that it was stolen by the artists, but anything to do with any art moved in that period. Some people will deal with it. Some people won't. Um, Sotheby's will, but then they have this head of restitution, and his job and his team is to make sure that if it belongs to someone, it goes back to them. So they are making an effort to do it. They're also putting more money into it. Um, they are training up art historians specifically to work on Nazi art and, and um, um, get, you know, giving it back. So, but it's very slow. I mean, it's what, 70 odd yeah. years later and we're only now just, you know, starting to put the money into this and, and the talent and trying to find this. So, um, there are a lot of databases set up. There's trace.com. There's the art loss register, which is a good one. You can go in and actually search that one. Um, there are bills. There's something called the Washington principles. Basically everybody kind of agrees that, um, they'll, um, encourage museums to find and identify Nazi art. Is it like, mm. like, like museums need to be encouraged. Like they, they should, that's what drives me crazy. So 44 countries signed up for the Washington principles. Why would you even need the Washington principles if these museums were above board anyway? Because morally, yeah. that's what you're doing. You shouldn't have to have a set of guidelines to return Nazi art. It's like, return it. That's it. Bang. Um, but then, yeah. So the Louvre actually um, has done something interesting. So they've actually done as much research as they can. And they've actually put on display a specific um, a section of the museum, which is Nazi looted art. And they acknowledge this is Nazi looted art. Um, and they're hoping to find the owners, so they're hoping someone. Oh, will by come putting it on display, maybe people will come forward and recognize it. It's a great idea. Yeah. yeah exactly. So they're hoping either that or a family member. But basically, um, because this has gone on so long, what they're waiting for is either uh, kids or grandkids to come forward 
Mm-hmm. And because of globalization, and because people have moved a lot, because a lot of the Jewish families, particularly when they were able to get out, um, moved abroad, it's very difficult for future generations to prove that, hey, my grandfather owned that. Right. Uh, and the longer it gets drawn out, the less and less chance there is of the art being restored. So that's where you get um, very, very conservative countries like Switzerland and like Hungary, for example, who really, really, really drag their feet on returning this. They're, like, just, even if they... they're just waiting out the, the, the descendants. Yeah, they pretty much are, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But it's just, uh, yeah, I was really, really surprised by all this. Um, the other thing we should probably mention is Russia. Oh, uh, yeah. That's um, one thing I was wondering. Did Russia do similar things like uh, plunder Poland? So I yeah. know that, you know, they're both Nazi Germany and Russia shared that. And, of course, the Iron Curtain itself. Well, when Russia started retreating, they actually took the art as sort of compensation for the destruction that the Nazis had done to any um, sort of Russian places. And so they were moving out and they stopped. They just took everything they could. Um, Wow. They took pretty much more than a million works of art. They call it trophy art. Um, Like it's specifically called trophy art. And it's more than one million pieces they took. Um, So Berlin... So there's a big argument going on, and it's still going on to this day. So Germany, so Berlin is saying that Russia is in breach of international law, and Moscow says that it's compensation for destruction by the Nazis, and they're not giving any of it back. So that's a million pieces of art that belonged to other people that was looted by the Nazis that families are now no longer going to get back because Russia kind of doesn't wow. want. Well, do you have a dollar figure on that? I don't know. Sorry. Just to, but to, to, I want to be mad at the Russians for doing that, but from a historical perspective, that's how war goes. The spoils go to the victor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but but they are violating things like treaties with that. Yeah, and the other thing is... Because that is going to specify how they are to be, uh, you know... Giving um, damages, if you were, yeah, but to the, the people. One, the other, but the other thing is that there are other laws and other rules that people are supposed to be following, but they they don't follow them when it comes specifically to not stupid art. It's a <laughs> the whole Russians other... obey the law, the rules that they want to obey that serve right. them. <laughs> well, just to give you an example, so in um, in Germany, if you steal something and you don't get caught, and you, you have it in your possession for 30 years, that's 3-0, then it's yours. It, it, it's, you anything? Know, you can, anything, except Nazi art. Now, technically, the law does apply to looted art. So technically, Gurlitt was allowed to own or keep all of the art because he don't get it for more than 30 years. And he actually said that. I've had this for 30 years. It's all mine. The thing is, the Germans don't, they don't use that rule when it comes to looted art. It, it's just, they just huh. don't. Um, I mean, it would be incredibly bad if they did. Right. I mean, it just, and they are, they are trying, they are one of the countries that are trying to get art back to people. And, you know, I, I will say that for them. They actually do a better job of returning art, despite the whole history. They do a better job in modern times of identifying art and trying to get it back than for example, Hungary and Switzerland and Russia, which I found incredibly surprising. I don't so much with Hungary, if you look at who uh, is at the helm of power right well, that's now. What, yeah, that's what I said. It's, it, it's mostly the yeah. people that are very conservative and have been, like, like tend to be conservative for over generations. Um, and yeah, it does depend on who's in power. So, Victor Orban, that is. Yeah, it's. I just wanted to, you know, my point with the historical perspective on this is that the returning of art that's never been done before. The even the attempt to return possessions that were taken during wartime, it's never been done before until World War Two. 
Well, this was a whole other level. And this wasn't just destroying art or taking art. This was destroying people's culture. And yeah. that's a whole... That, that's a whole that, it's happened thing. through since the first two guys got in a fist fight. It's always been the case. Nobody's ever in the history of the world tried to correct that until until World War II. I just don't think it's ever gone on in such an industrial level as World War II, and I don't think that other wars were about destroying culture. They were about, I want your land. You have something I want. I'm going to come in and take it. Whereas this guy had deep psychologically bizarre rooted hatred of Jews and wanted to wipe them off the planet. That's, that's well, the whole other... Well, I mean, Genghis thing, Khan I wiped off entire cultures. Not as many as you think. He actually did absorb them into his own tribe. Well, yeah, eventually when they, you know, yeah, that's a whole, that's a different thing. But... <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, yeah, just, I mean, the, the extermination of the Jews and the gypsies and all, all of the unwanted people, what that was unprecedented for sure. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I just think that, uh, you know, the people who stepped up and recognized that this was going on and it needed to be corrected and, and you know, went out and actually did it, you know, that's well, a remarkable thing in the annals of history. Well, the other thing is that they, uh, and, I, and again, it's a difficult topic to, without sounding like you're either supporting Nazis or you're not, or, you know, like it's, it's just a difficult topic to, to put into words. But I think that the modern day Germans are so aware yes, of, they what, are. of what happened that the only mm -hmm. thing to do is offer artwork back because they can't offer people's families. They can't offer culture. They can't offer the buildings they destroyed, the children they killed. They can't give any of that back. And sure, they can shuffle their feet and go, oh, we're sorry, but at least this is a tangible thing they can try and do. It's, just, it's, it's compared to what they did, it's small. But to the Jewish families that had this artwork and they're getting it back, it's huge. It it's is. massive. Yeah, it is. And I, actually, there, a couple of weeks ago, there was a piece of, um, my, I think my friend Michelle is listening. Um, she's a, she's a, an, um, she plays in an orchestra, I think a few months ago. Um, a famous piece of music was returned to a family. So the Nazis stole not only artwork and statues, they stole books, they stole um, music. Um, and I think it was an original, it was an original piece anyway. It belonged to a, a Jewish family and they got it back. And it was, it was a huge deal. It's always a huge deal when something, you know, gets back. Yeah. It's almost like trying to give them a sense of closure for something that they could possibly never have closure for. But I think that's probably why this is, this is the big, this is why they're pushing so hard. This is why there's um, repatriation efforts all over the place. Plus with the world seeing what happened and the world being so disgusted with what happened, the world has set rules about this kind of thing. We must get this stuff back here. We've got the Washington principles. We've got the U.S., you know, this. We've got this rule. This is, you know, that sort of thing. Hmm. Yeah, it's, um, oh, I, I had a question there was a scene, a couple of shots in the movie Monuments Men when the uh, Allies were closing in that uh, they just started burning stuff. The Germans just started burning things. Uh, and that really happened? I know they did burn art. I They burnt specific art, though. Like they had, like, you know, like you have book burnings out in the middle of the, like, a, a, yeah. like a parking lot or whatever. Um, they had art burnings. And it was the sort of degenerate art that no one really wanted. Whether they actually burned it like they did in Monuments Men, like set fire to an entire um, mine, I don't know if that happened. I think it. No, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna okay. commit to anything. I yeah. I, I I was reading the book and I don't remember reading about it in the book um, because the the movie is based on a book and these guys because these guys mm -hmm. were in case people don't know who they are. It's a a group of American um, art history people and sculptures and um, basically art people who could go in and <laughs> they tried to advise the American army, please don't bomb this building because it's got special stuff in it. When they couldn't do that, they at least devoted their efforts to retrieving some of the art um, that the Nazis had hidden. And that's how they discovered that a lot of the art was stored in these salt mines. Hmm. So that's actually basically how we got the Mona Lisa back. 
the Monuments men discovered all of this art in one of the salt mines and she was in there with them. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I recommend the movie, even though yep. it does have Clooney in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he yeah. directed it too. Of, oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> He's magic. He can do everything. <laughs> he can play any role that it requires George Clooney. <laughs> it's like um, the guy that plays Deadpool. Uh, what's, I know he's Canadian. Ryan Reynolds. Ryan Reynolds. Ryan Reynolds plays Ryan Reynolds in everything. Yeah. Even the commercials he does. Like he's <laughs> yep. <laughs> Good job if you can get it. The same, like, the same as... Uh. Basically, all the people in Monument, Monuments Men, except for the guy who was in Downton Abbey, maybe a little bit him, they all pretty much play themselves in every movie. That Brad Pitt always plays Brad Pitt. Yep. <laughs> and nobody yeah. does it better. That's true. Did you mm. actually, that's funny. Did you see him in, uh, uh, what were we just talking about? The oh, the Ryan Reynolds movie, Deadpool. Did you see him in Deadpool too? I did. Yeah, I liked it. You know, guest it appearance? wasn't as good as number one, but I thought it was but watchable. Brad, but Brad Pitt had a cameo. He did. Right, right. Yeah. I thought it was funny. Sorry, just there's just a little thing there. We were talking about Ryan Reynolds, and then we're talking about... And anyway, it, there was a little... Anyway, I, anyway um, so yeah, basically, it's ongoing. It will be ongoing for forever, probably. Um I'm really astounded. The other thing I was astounded by is the positivity of the people that are working on this. Because the sheer size of it. Um, so, for example, in France, 100,000 pieces of work were stolen. 60,000 were brought back. 45 were returned to families, like of that 60,000. 2,000 were trusted to museums. And 13,000 were sold for a profit by the state. Um, and the topic is pretty much now like taboo in France. So it's it's a very, very difficult topic for like just well everybody. And it should be. I'm not saying it shouldn't be. Um, Why should it be a taboo topic? Well, it, it, the artwork, um, how much they have and who has it and who wears it hanging and, you know, which museums is it supposed to be in. And they don't really, I don't know, It's it's just they don't really like talking about it very much um as long as they make an effort to get all the artwork and stuff back i don't think they like going into the history of it um and i don't think they well i don't think anybody should enjoy going into the history of that sort of thing but um but on, at the same time uh, when you get all these um so for example the sotheby's guy the head of uh, the global head of repatriation and then you get a couple of other you get a lot of museums the museum at burn the museum at Bern, that was a kind of a weird one um that's where Gerlitz's work went but there's so many people that are just so positive that they're going to keep finding more. And they do find more. They find a few pieces maybe every few years. Nothing like the 1400 at Gerlitz Place. But it, it's all ongoing. But they are positive that they're going to keep finding it. And there are some pretty significant missing pieces out there. There are some Rembrandts that are worth like, you know, a, a billion dollars pretty much. Um, there's a lot of stuff out there they know of that is still missing. And people... I don't know. Maybe I'm just a little bit cynical, but I, I'm not sure they're going to get it back. But there are people there that actually think, yes, we're going to get this back. Mm. Good luck to them. Yeah, yeah definitely. It's, it's kind of nice because they've devoted their lives to getting this artwork back and trying to do this restitution. And they actually believe that they're going to keep finding more and more. And I'm, you know, all luck to them. I hope they do. Well, you know, the, the advent of... Uh, you know, if they had to do this in an analog world, it'd be it would be impossible. <laughs> uh, but the you know the digital revolution and the uh, advent of the internet and stuff like that has probably made their job infinitely easier. You would, yeah, you would actually think so. But there's funny. I watched um, a documentary about the art loss, art loss register. And they actually have a, they have all the databases and stuff, and they have people at computers entering stuff in the database. But they've got this giant whiteboard up on the wall behind them with all this writing on it for tracing various pieces of art, and it's crazy. Mm -hmm. If you think they've got databases, why don't they use those? They've got computers, but they still actually do like paper and whiteboards and markers, and it's 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 crazy. Mm. Oh yeah. yeah. You're absolutely right. With the way that um, the way that digital, like the photography and and the way that the world is digitized, it's a lot easier. But then, the other part of that is, um, if if I if I find a painting and it belongs to you, I can send you a picture of it. You can say yes, but you have to prove it to me. 
And if you don't have the appropriate records, there's no amount of digital that's going to help you with that. Probably not. Yes. Uh, yeah. And sometimes even if you do have the provenance, some of these countries will not read. Like Hungary, for example, is really difficult. Even if you can prove beyond a doubt that something um, isn't isn't yours, they have difficulty with it. Mm. Austria is like that as well. There was a, there was a, a picture um, by Klimt. It's a very famous picture. It's like a, a golden woman. Um, it's a very long, the skinny kiss. Do you know what do you know what I mean? It's every university student has it hanging in their in their room. Um, the kiss, yeah. It's not the kiss, but it's the same guy that painted it. Um, this one is just a single woman, but it's kind of the same style. It's a yellow woman. Huh. She's, yeah, she's wearing gold, like just everything is all golden on it. And the Austrians agreed, yeah, this has been stolen, but they wouldn't give it back until recently. But that went on for at least twenty or thirty years. Oh, Great. by the way, the Gerlich collection is DW.com. Oh, cool. Okay. That's an easy one. Wow. <laughs> you can go and say hi to Gerlich friends. So that's... <laughs> That's such a small part of such a huge topic, but I hope I at least covered it a little bit. <laughs> no, yeah, that was, you, did, you a did a great job. job. As always. Yeah, fantastic. Thought, it's, a, it's a big so, topic to cover in an hour. It's a huge topic, yeah. I mean, people people do degrees in this, it's, and we did it in an hour. So, hey, well done us. <laughs> <laughs> um, send us $20, and we'll send you your degree. <laughs> I've got Photoshop. I can make it look pretty. Yep. <laughs> okay. Any final comments? None for me. All right. Okay, well, thank you so much for having me on for the last three weeks. It's been such a blast. I, I, I talk about art forever. you got to tell me to shut up or I just won't. No, I don't think I will tell you. <laughs> no. <Nope. laughs> Well, I've already I've already been insulted today on Twitter, so thanks. Yeah, keep your keep your comments to yourself. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I saw that that person was a total idiot. Yep, I thought so. He was one of the drop an insult and then block before I could even say anything, which I was so disappointed by. I really wanted to say something, but anyway, I, I just... total douche. Canoe. Yeah. The British side of me was laughing my head off. The Canadian side of me wanted to crawl under a rock. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the British side won. All good. Cool. All right. Good night, everybody. Night. night. <laughs>